Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, this is my true crime podcast where once a week I sit down and I talk about all things true crime, ranging from murders, disappearances, cults, all the way to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can head over to the YouTube channel and watch the visual version every Wednesday or you can head over to Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts and listen to the audio version every Tuesday. Now for today's case, we are going to be talking about the case of Jordan Davis. Now there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. On November 23rd of 2012, Michael Dunn and his girlfriend of four years and recent fiance of six months, 45-year-old Rhonda Rauer, were on their way to attend Michael's son's wedding. The wedding was at the Winterbourne Inn and Rhonda and Michael had lived in Brevard County, which is about a two-hour drive away. And so they set out for this two-hour ride and while on the ride, they actually brought their French bulldog named Charlie with because because they were going to be out all day and had no one to watch them. As they were staying in this different town, they were actually staying at a hotel overnight. And so earlier that day, the two of them had checked themselves into the hotel. They had checked their dog into the hotel and started to just settle in. Mrs. Rower, do you know someone by the name of Michael Dunn? Y- yes, I do. How long have you known Mr. Dunn for? About four years. Ms. Rower, what is your relationship to Mr. Dunn? He's my fiance. Why did you and the defendant come up to Jacksonville on Thursday night for the Friday wedding? Um, because we have a puppy named Charlie, and um, because you usually can't check into hotels until like three or four and with the wedding being at four we didn't think we'd have time to get settled after that the couple drove 15 miles to the wedding and everything about the ceremony was beautiful everyone was laughing and having a good time and drinking Rhonda drank a glass of red wine and two to three rum and cokes and michael drank about three to four rum and cokes all within a three hour span as the couple was there unfortunately they did have to leave early because as i said they had a dog back at the hotel that they needed to, you know, take out for walks and stuff. And so the couple left the reception early. But on the way home, Rhonda suggested that they stop at a gas station so that she could grab a bottle of wine that they could share together at the hotel that night. And so that's exactly what they did. The couple pull into the gas station parking lot and pulls up specifically right next to a red Dodge Durango. In the car was teenagers Leyland Brunson, Jordan Davis, and Tevin Thompson. While the driver of the car, 18-year-old Tommy Storms, was inside of the gas station buying a pack of cigarettes. All three of the boys were just, you know, hanging out, laughing, having a good time, waiting for their friend to get back. It was a nice day outside, so the kids had their windows down and their music blasting, specifically rap music, because that was just their favorite genre. The defendant say anything about the music when he parked the car next to the red car? Yes. And what did the defendant say? Oh, I hate that thug music. And what was your response to the defendant? I said, yes, I know. What happened, Ms. Rauer, after the defendant parked the car? Um, I gave him a kiss. I took $20 and I went into the store. It seemed like the boys were just kind of minding their own business, doing their own thing, but when Rhonda went into the gas station, that is when Michael spoke up to the car full of teenagers and said to them, quote, can you turn that music down? I can't hear myself speak. So Tevin Thompson was actually in the passenger seat and he complied with Michael. He turned down the music exactly as he said. And then after that, Michael rolled up his window and the two of them didn't talk to one another. Mr. Thompson, while the three of you were waiting for Tommy Storms, did the defendant say anything to you or in your direction? Yes, sir. And what was that? He said, can you turn the music down? I can't hear myself think. And what did you do when he said, turn the music down? I turned the music down. When you turned the music down, did either Leland Brunson or Jordan Davis say anything to you? Yes, sir. Who spoke? Jordan. And what did Jordan Davis say? Uh, turn the music back up. But whilst in the car, Jordan put up a little bit of a fuss and he said that it's unfair for a stranger to tell them how loud they should be playing their music. It's a nice day outside. They just want to enjoy the day. They want to listen to music. They want to have the windows down. And it's not like their friend was going to be inside of the store forever. They're probably going to sit there for max five minutes. And so that is when Jordan tells Tevin to turn up the music. At this time is when Tommy Storms enters 
goes back into the car and when he does that is when Tevin, Jordan, and Leyland explain to Tommy the entire situation that just went down with Michael. And what did you do when you got back to the Durango? I opened the door, I danced a little bit to the song that was playing, I got in the car. Did you see or hear the driver say anything to Jordan Davis after Tommy Storms got back in the Durango? Yes. What was that? Are you talking to me? And how could you hear that? Tevin turned the music down. When? When Tommy got back in to let him know what happened. Did Jordan Davis say anything back to the driver when the driver said, are you talking to me? Yes. What did he say? Yeah, I'm talking to you. So as the group of friends are just talking amongst themselves, that is when Michael, for some reason, notices that they are talking about him. And so Jordan is saying things like, F that guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, just turn up the music, like, let's leave. And then at this point, that's when Michael rolls down his window and yells to Jordan saying, quote, are you talking to me? And Jordan yells back saying, quote, yeah, I'm talking to you. Now, for the following events, there was a key witness to what happens next, and this witness was named Witness 7, and Witness 7 took to the stand to explain the following events. Witness 7 said that he indeed did see the red Durango playing loud rap music, but he purposely did not park next to the red car just because he, quote, didn't want to deal with it. And so he went inside, he got what he needed to get, and then when he came outside, that is when he saw Michael yelling to the Red Durango, quote, no, you're not going to talk to me that way. And it was in this moment where he then sees Michael reach into his glove box, pull out a gun, and start open firing at the car full of teenagers. It was a big silver chrome, either a 9mm or a 45. It was a large caliber. You recognize that? Yes, sir. Does that appear to be the gun that you saw in the defendant's hand? Yes, sir. And what did the driver do with the gun when he grabbed it from the glove compartment? He was holding it and cocked it back. And it was at this point where Rhonda, who's inside of the gas station, is hearing all of the gunshots and she's looking through the window to see what's going on. As you were walking to the register, did you hear anything unusual? Yes. What did you hear? I heard pop, pop, pop. Within three minutes of Michael pulling into the gas station parking lot, he has created an argument with innocent teenagers just enjoying their music, minding their business, and then following it up with open firing 10 rounds into the car. The first three shots landed in the back passenger where Jordan was. And then when those three shots were shot, that is when Tommy immediately reverses and tries to pull out of the parking lot. The fourth shot had missed, but as for for shots five, six, and seven, those hit the front passenger. As the car was driving off, that is when Michael got out of his car and fired three more shots into the trunk of the car and doing all of this in four seconds. And although Tommy's quick thinking to reverse out of the parking lot did indeed save the lives of his friends, unfortunately, he was not able to save the life of 17-year-old Jordan Davis. Unfortunately, since Jordan was sitting closest to where Michael was, the gunshots had hit him first. He was shot in the legs, the lungs, and the heart. And the shot that hit his heart actually hit a vital artery. So when he was shot, Jordan bled out in the back seat in just 45 seconds. 20 seconds after the shots were fired, that's when Rhonda comes out of the gas station and that's when she sees that Michael was actually the one that was shooting. And so when Michael and Rhonda make eye contact, Michael immediately tells Rhonda to get in the car immediately so that they can go back to the hotel. I opened the door and he said, get in the car. And I don't know if I said what, or, or if I said anything, or if I just hesitated, and he said, get in the car. But he was, you know, he just had a, that, that sound in his voice, you know, of urgency. urgency. Yeah. yeah, and so I got in the car. You get in the car, he pulls out mm -hmm. to leave. What's the conversation like in the car? Well, I asked him, uh, what, what happened? Right. That's what I said. I said, what happened? And he said, 
I shot at the car. And I'm like, and we're moving at this time. Right. And um, I said, what car? And he said, the one with the music. And I said, why? And he said, because they threatened to kill me. And I'm like, I, I don't understand, Michael. And I don't remember the words, exact words that he used, but it was like that they started started to advance, and I reacted. Okay, they started to advance, and I reacted. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I then I asked him, I said, did you hurt anyone? And he said, no, I just shot at the car. And, uh, and you know, in my head, should I be telling you what I was thinking? Yeah, I think you've, oh, already, okay. you've already told us. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you just, just tell me. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in my head I'm thinking, you know, you stupid ass, you know, okay. what, 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 were you, what were you thinking? Why, you know, would you do this? But I could see that he was already upset, and I didn't want to add to that. Right. So I kept those thoughts to myself, and I figured I'd just tell him in the morning. Okay. And is this all in the car? Or yes. Is, okay, this is all in the car. And then by then... We were back at the hotel. It was then where the couple got back to the hotel and just kind of acted as if nothing really happened. When they got back to the hotel, Michael and her took their dog out for a walk around the block. They went out and they got a pizza. They brought it back to the hotel and Michael drank a stiff rum and coke. Rhonda did say that that night, although Michael didn't tell her the full story of what happened, there was a lot of tension in the air. She could tell that there was something else going on, that there was definitely something Michael wasn't telling her because that whole entire night, they barely spoke to one another. So then the next morning on Saturday, November 24th of 2012, while Rhonda and Michael are getting ready to leave the hotel, Rhonda decides to put on the news just as background noise. So as she's getting ready for the day, she hears the news and she hears buzzwords such as, quote, loud music, shooting, convenience store and one person dead. As soon as Rhonda hears this, she looks up at the TV and that's when she sees the red Dodge Durango that they were parked to the day before sitting in the parking lot of the gas station that they were there the day before. So when she sees this, she looks to Michael and Michael looks at her and immediately Michael tells her, grab the dog, get in the car, we're driving home right now. And that's exactly what they did. They frantically packed up all of their things and they drove two hours straight back to Brevard County. Rhonda said that this whole entire two-hour car ride, the couple did not speak to one another. The only time they really spoke was that every once in a while, Michael would turn down the radio just to tell Rhonda that he loved her, while Rhonda just sat there crying in shock of what was going on. So then eventually, Michael and Rhonda got back to their home in Brevard County, but as soon as they showed up, they were greeted with police officers asking them to come down to the station for questioning. How the police even found where Michael was, was that a bystander of the situation that was witnessing the shooting actually took down Michael's license plate number and later on gave it to the police when they arrived on scene and that's how they were able to track down Michael. Obviously, Michael knows now that he has killed someone, that these shots weren't just, you know, random open fire just to scare them off. He has a murder charge on him and so, of course, with this much pressure and intensity, you are going to do all in your power to deflect from the truth and try to victimize yourself as much as possible. And so Michael, in the first half of the story, actually did tell the truth. He said that the day before he attended his son's wedding and then on the way home to the hotel from the wedding, he stopped at a gas station with Rhonda so that Rhonda could pick up a glass of wine and he pulled up next to a red Dodge Durango. When Rhonda was inside buying the wine, he said that these kids were playing extremely loud rap music that he just didn't really like. And so he rolled down his window, he asked the kids to turn the music down, and the kids did so. They did indeed turn the music down. Now, a key word to notice in this portion is the use of the word kids. Now, Michael, in the beginning of the interrogation, says things like, oh, I don't know how many kids were in that car, or this kid was mouthing off, or the kid in the front seat turned down the volume 
volume. Later on, Michael tries to argue that he didn't even know that they were kids. He actually thought that they were grown men. Then he says that after the music was turned down, Michael rolled up his window, but he could hear a conversation going on through his window of the kid in the back seat, who was Jordan Davis. Jordan was saying things such as, quote, F him, F that, followed with the music being turned back all the way up. And from this part in the interrogation, it looks like Michael is starting to get a little bit fidgety. At this point in the interrogation, he's playing with his fingers, he's looking down at the ground, and it's probably because Michael is currently recounting all of the gruesome details of what happened after Jordan said, yes, I'm talking to you. And it's also very prominent that when you watch this interrogation, which I will include clips of, Michael seems as if he's just making up this story as he goes along. And I don't know if they're singing or what, but it's like, um, they're saying, kill him. So I put my window down again, and I said, excuse me, are you, are you talking about me? Um, and it was like, um, kill that bitch. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm still not reacting, but then this guy, like, goes down on the ground and comes up with something. I thought it was a shotgun. And he goes, you're dead, bitch, and he opens his door. Mm-hmm. And... I'm shitting bricks. Michael said that since he was being threatened, you know, he was given death threats, Michael said that he could have sworn he saw a barrel on it as if Jordan was lifting up a shotgun in order to kill Michael or to hurt Michael. In a moment of fear, he quickly grabs the gun out of his glove compartment and starts open firing at Jordan and the car in general in order to defend himself. Now, to me personally, this part of of the story is obviously fabricated because as you will see later on when the police analyze the car, there was no weapons in the car. There was no guns in the car. And so to me, it's just so odd that Michael would say a shotgun because I don't know anyone who just like conventionally holds shotguns around unless you're like in a 1950s Western cowboy movie. Usually if you are one to carry a gun, you would carry a gun that is easy to carry not this like huge, you know, theatrical gun. And on top of that crazy lie, Michael then continues to tell the detectives, like, it's so crazy. He basically flexes on his gun skills and he talks for a good like two minutes straight about how fluid his motion was when he was like grabbing his gun and he has friends in the military that taught him how to properly shoot a gun. That's when I reached in my glove box, mm-hmm. unholstered my pistol. I mean, I'm, I practiced this. I'm at the um, Fort Malabar rifle and pistol range. I'm an avid, mm-hmm. you know, gun guy and all that. No <clears throat> military training or anything, but I have friends who are in the military that right. show me the proper way. Yes, and so um, quicker in the flash, I had uh, a round chambered in it and I I shot. As if these detectives were gonna be impressed or something. And so another thing to note about Michael is his behavior and his demeanor. Usually recounting a traumatic experience like this, especially with the way that Michael puts it, it seems like he was in a near-death experience. And something as traumatic as this, especially happening only 22 hours before, you would think that you would recount it with, you know, emotion or anxiety or fear. When Michael was explaining all of this, he seemed very monotone very closed off, didn't really show much emotion. And instead, Michael then explains the story with ease, as well as long pauses to, you know, hold critical thinking, as well as complimenting himself every now and again. The detectives asked him, well, you know, we analyzed the car and we saw that there were four gunshots in the back of the car, like in the trunk. How do you explain that? If this was self-defense, why did you, you know, get out of your car to 
continue shooting at that car when clearly they all they wanted to do was leave the situation. Like you should have left the situation too. Michael to this says that the only reason he shot the back of the car was because he was scared like being in a strange town and being in like a strange neighborhood. He didn't know if there was another car that was gonna come after him. Literally makes no sense but that was his logic as to why he was shooting at the back of the car. Throughout the interrogation as well Michael continues to reiterate how scared for his life he was and he's never been so terrified and he just felt helpless and lost reiterating these things to try to get sympathy from the police. But the police are not buying this because the police then ask Michael well what did you do afterwards? Anyone who had encountered a near-death experience especially if you feel like you were in a position of innocence and you were being wrongfully attacked the first thing you would do would be to go to the police you know this is something anybody would do but when the police asked Michael did you ever file a police report did you ever go to the station Michael just replies with quote no we went back to the hotel just you know waiting for another car load of thugs to come by i've never been so scared in my life it was clear that michael knew in the moment that he had done something wrong because anyone who had experienced something like that the first thing anybody would do is to go to the police for some sort of report for some sort of protection he chose not to go to the police he chose not to protect himself because he knew deep down that he was in the wrong and he didn't want to be caught up for it. When Rhonda was being interviewed, the detectives also asked her a couple of questions about the night as well and they asked Rhonda if Michael had brought his gun up to the hotel room because since Michael was so easy to use his gun for self-defense earlier, you would think that Michael would use his gun later on for self-defense again. But Rhonda said that Michael did not bring his gun up at all. Rhonda said that when they came back to the hotel, they just took their dog out for a walk around the block, grabbed pizza, drank a little bit, and went to sleep. So he's not comfortable going to the police, but he's comfortable walking around the block, walking his dog defenseless, just out in the open where anything could happen. The police knew from hotel security footage that Michael and Rhonda did indeed leave the hotel room, but when they were asking Michael what did he do when he went back to the hotel, Michael said that all him and Rhonda did was was just relax. They ordered a pizza, they hung out with their dog, and then they went to sleep, and he claims that they never left the hotel room. So now that they caught Michael up in a lie, this is when the detectives start to turn up the pressure a little bit to try to get Michael to confess. Their main objective is to hopefully get Michael feeling very overstimulated, very overwhelmed. Since Michael is lying and he has to keep up with his lies, it gets very confusing very quickly. And so this is what they're trying to to get Michael to do. They're trying to get him to slip up so that hopefully he just cuts his losses and confesses. So the police then ask him to just basically run them through the story one more time to ensure that they have all of the details. Now this is very scary for Michael because he doesn't remember what he said and what he hasn't said. He doesn't know if his future lies are going to contradict with his past lies. And so at this point, Michael reiterates the story, but now with no new details. Police start asking him things like, well, if you thought the other car had a gun, why did you pull out your gun? Why didn't you just reverse like Tommy did? If this man actually had a gun, they wouldn't have pulled away out of fear. They would have, you know, put up a fight. Your hotel room, you're calling the order pizza. Why aren't you calling us? I wanted to come back to my hometown to do that. You know, I shouldn't even left the scene, mm -hmm. but I left the scene because I was still afraid for. Okay, and I and I, I can I can I can I can live with that. Okay, I can live with that. You don't necessarily want to hang around right where the shooting happened because you don't know if these guys are coming back. I I'm good with. Or that. if there are more. You know, but once you leave, and you are away from that scene and you've even gotten to a hotel room and inside your hotel room at that point. You know, now it doesn't, now it makes me wonder, you know, because if you make a phone call, one, we find out, you know, a lot quicker what's going on. 
Okay. The reason he and I haven't been asleep since sometime yesterday is because we're trying to figure out. All we know is we got a guy, we got a dead kid in a car, okay, and we got a guy who shot and hauled ass. That's all we know. I mean, I, I just, I'm just, that's where we start to get a little concerned. It starts to be, mm, you know. There was no weapon in the car. There was no gun in the car. There was nothing in the car that even resembled a gun. That's why these teenagers drove out of the parking lot so quick because they were scared for their life. They didn't have anything to defend themselves with. And so the police tell Michael to basically reenact how he pulled his gun out of the glove box. And when Michael does so, the police notice that when Michael, you know, reenacts it, he puts two hands on the gun instead of one hand. Now, this is very important because when you put two hands on a gun, that means it's intentional. It's done with thought. But when you have one hand on the gun, that's more of, you know, a panicky stance. You're not really going to pay attention to your form if you are in a high stress situation that you're usually not used to. And so having two hands on the gun proved that Michael thought thoroughly about what he was going to do and he was specifically aiming at someone or something instead of just casually opening fire. And furthermore, he adds new details to the story, including that when he said he saw Jordan pull up what looked like a shotgun, he said that he also saw Jordan about to get out of the car. He said that he saw the door open a little bit and that's why Michael grabbed his gun and started shooting, but the police quickly call him out on this and just tell him that makes no sense. If you were going to shoot someone that was parked right next to you, why would you get out of the car? You literally have two feet of space in between you. There is no reason for you to get out of the car. He would have just shot Michael from his car, such as Michael did to these teenagers. Michael didn't have to get out of the car in order to shoot them. He just shot them where they were at. When Michael realizes how dumb this sounds, he immediately backtracks and he goes to his original story and he then says well I don't know for sure if he was getting out but I'm pretty sure and I think he was getting out but this theory was later proven wrong because when the police did an analysis on the car they checked out the angle of the bullets going through the door and the exit and entrance wounds found on Jordan's body the exit and entrance wounds of the bullet in the door that Jordan was sitting on there's no way that that door could have been opened open because if the door was open, the bullet um, pathways would like be a little bit different. The angle would be different, but the angle looked as if the car door was closed to begin with. And so it was clear that Michael was now lying again. The police at this point are not putting up with it. They're calling him out and they're saying there's no way the door was open. We checked out the bullet in the car. There's no way that car door was open. And to this, Michael just says, quote, I mean, he's getting out of his car were close to each other. He's getting out of his car after repeatedly telling me that he was going to kill me. So is he going to bite my ear off or shoot me with a shotgun? I wasn't too concerned about how he intended to do it. So Michael says that Jordan told Michael repeatedly that he was going to kill him and then furthermore pulled out a shotgun. And as he was getting out of the car, Michael reacted out of fear and grabbed his gun and started shooting shooting at him before he could shoot back at him. And then ends it off with saying, quote, I wasn't too concerned about how he intended to do it. Now that's very interesting because if someone is approaching you with a shotgun, you're going to be very concerned about how they intend to kill you. I mean, any situation, no matter where you are, if someone comes at you with a weapon, you're going to be very concerned at how they are going to be using that weapon onto you. So now that Michael is starting to get called out for all of his lives, the pressure is building. So he starts to exaggerate the story a little bit more to make it sound more like in his favor and that he was the victim. So five minutes ago, Michael said that Jordan said that he was going to kill Michael. He said to his face as he was getting out of the car, quote, 
I'm going to kill you, bitch. Michael said that that's what Jordan told him as Jordan was supposedly getting out of the car, but Michael said just five minutes ago that Jordan only said it once, but now that the tension is building, the pressure is building, Michael now changes his story and said that Jordan was actually saying it multiple times to him. And so to these exaggerative comments, the detectives flat out tell Michael, well, we interviewed the other boys in the car and the other boys admitted that Jordan was a little mouthy. Jordan was saying things like, go F yourself, F this guy, but at no point was any death threats made or any threats to safety made. I'll tell you this, we talked to the other guys in the car and they will all admit, they will all tell us he didn't like the fact that some stranger is telling him to turn his music down. He's 17, he's a, he's a teenager, okay? You know, you know how teenagers are. They're a little hard-headed sometimes, especially when they're out on their own. And did, did he throw some F-bombs at you? Basically tell you to go fuck yourself multiple times? Absolutely. They said, yep, he was jaw-jacking back and forth with that guy. But at, but at no time did any of them say, well, okay, he did say he was going to kill him. Because what's, it, it makes no sense, because what's he going to do? He's not armed. What, what's he, what's he going to, oh, I'm going to kill you and get out of a car. And we're talking about a kid. You know how many times that kid's been to jail? Never. He has no history of violence. And it's, it's not like we're getting some street thugs. I'm bringing this kid's ass as a in school. We're not talking about a violent kid here. He has no track record. There are guys in Jacksonville who I'd go, okay, I believe that. Because they got track records. This kid ain't got no track record. His friends basically said that Jordan and Michael were having a typical bicker about the volume of the music. It was nothing too intense, which is understandable because Jordan was a kid. He was a 17-year-old kid. And usually kids and teenagers, when they're out on their own, they tend to be a little bit hot-headed. They tend to be, you know, a little bit aggressive towards adults, especially adults telling them what to do. But Michael, as the adult, should have recognized this and just let kids be kids. And the police also tell Michael that this makes no sense as to why Jordan would make death threats, considering Jordan has a squeaky clean record. He has never gotten in trouble with the law in his life, and there was no weapons found in the car, not even something that he could use as a weapon, like a baseball bat or something. The only thing they really found in the car was like some shoes, a speaker, a basketball, some like old cups and wrappers. Like it just looked like like a normal car. There was nothing suspicious about it. Jordan Davis was a high school student from Jacksonville, Florida, and was described by every one of his friends and family as funny and kind and outgoing. He was actually part of his school's ROTC program and was loyal to all of his family and friends. They described Jordan to be the type of person that would stick up for his friends in a heartbeat. He had a very close relationship with his family especially his younger brothers and his father. Loved his family very, very much and would do anything for them. And throughout his life, he was a really good kid. He was homeschooled for most of his life, but he did really well in school. He had never been into jail. He has never gone into fights in general, like not even physical street altercations or in school. His criminal record was clean and he kept a clean record on purpose because as I said, he was a part of like the military program at his school. I'm assuming, you know, since Jordan was in this program, he probably wanted to do something in the military or some division of the military after high school. And in order to get anywhere in the military, you need a clean record or somewhat of a clean record. And the detectives go on to tell Michael that Jordan would not have made a death threat because he had nothing on his record, no violence no fights, and not only did Jordan not have a record, Leyland sitting next to him 
also had a clean record. Tommy Storms driving the car had a clean record. Tevin Thompson sitting in the passenger had a clean record. None of these boys have ever gotten into any trouble with the law. They've never been arrested. They've never been into fights. Prior to them going to the gas station, all four of these boys were actually spending a day at the mall together because it was really nice outside. They just wanted to hang out with one another. And before Jordan was dropped off at his house to, you know, be with his loving and caring family, they stopped at the gas station so Tommy could get cigarettes real quick. And so as you can see, these kids were simply just kids enjoying themselves. Detectives also point out a slip in Michael's story where Michael apparently says that as Jordan was getting out of the car, Jordan said to him, quote, I'm gonna kill that guy. But the detectives say that how could Michael even hear Jordan say that if apparently the kids had turned up the music and the music was so loud that he could barely hear himself think, especially if Michael's window was rolled up while all of it was going on. Throughout the interrogation, Michael says things such as, quote, I don't want to lose my freedom and quote, I have so much going on in my personal life. The last thing I want to do is be in trouble. I don't want to cause you guys a sleepless night. And so from that, it seems like he's more concerned with himself and his personal life rather than the well-being of all of the other kids that were involved in the situation. Not once did Michael even ask the detectives, how are the other kids in the car? How did the other kids survive? Are they injured? Did I accidentally shoot them? How about the parents? Are the parents doing okay? Even when the police had told Michael that the kid that Michael had shot and killed was a 17-year-old boy that meant no harm, had no history of violence, and was simply just minding his business, hanging out with his friends, Michael showed no reaction and no emotion. And furthermore, to dig himself into this hole, follows those comments that the detectives just made, he follows that up by saying, quote, I don't mean to sound like an a-hole, but if it happened again tomorrow where a shotgun was coming up, I think I would do the same. I would hope I do the same. So he is admitting that if given the opportunity again to do it all over, he would not pull away. He would genuinely still kill an innocent boy. And another key word to, you know, remember in this is that when Michael explains, you know, what Jordan was saying to him, he uses the word like a lot. He says things such as, Oh, Jordan was saying things like, I'm gonna kill you, like you're dead, like F that guy, like F this. He says those words like as if it's more of a generalization of what Jordan was saying. And a very traumatic moment like this, especially happening just 22 hours prior and the moment only lasting three minutes, you would know or remember exact quotes. You wouldn't remember the general idea of what was being said was at this moment where the detectives also started to pull out crime scene photos and show Michael the crime scene photos. They tell Michael and they show Michael that clearly you hit the back door, you hit the front door, and you hit the trunk, and you hit the windows. That's not self-defense. That's anger. That's passionate. But nonetheless, Michael stands his ground and he says that it was indeed self-defense. Even though all of this evidence is being presented in front of him, Michael sticks to his point. Detectives do have enough evidence in order to arrest Michael. They were going to charge him with the murder of Jordan Davis and three counts of attempted murder. When Michael is told that he is being arrested and charged with these things, all he says is, quote, the way I see this, I was scared for my life and I fought back and you guys are seeing this as murder? Again, showing absolutely no sympathy for the situation at hand. He still thinks that he was justified in killing Jordan. And then after saying that, there's a long pause. And then Michael says, quote, do I need a lawyer? Because I feel like I'm in deep shit right now. The detectives then tell Michael, yes, you can have a lawyer if you want to. Michael then asks the detectives what he thinks his bail or bond would be, but the detectives tell him that in the Bavard County, they have a law where for murder charges, you have no bail and you have no bond. So Michael is 100% going to sleep in a jail cell tonight. To this, Michael argues back and says, quote, 
is it automatic that it's a murder charge when it's self-defense? And the detectives assure Michael that no, this was not a random decision that they made. They have a team of people that analyze the situation. They ask witnesses. They talk to people in the situation. They analyze the crime scene, the crime scene photos. They handle everything. And when looking over everything, then their team of people and the state attorney's office can conclude if an arrest warrant should be issued. And in this case, there should be an arrest warrant made for murder and three counts of murder against Michael. So no, this was not a random decision that was made. This was a decision that was made with a lot of careful consideration. Um, I, I, I really didn't know that I was being charged with murder and attempted murder. Mm -hmm. That sucks. As far as Michael's trial, Michael was arrested and charged with murder and three counts of attempted murder, and he stayed at the Duval County Jail for 14 months awaiting his trial. Once his trial actually came up, that's when Michael was able to speak his side of the story, and what do you know, there were new details added to this story. Michael then switches up his story and says that not only were the kids saying things such as F him, F this, but they were also calling Michael crap. Does it escalate? Well, the music came back on. Now it got ugly. After hearing the something something cracker and this and that, I hear, I should kill that motherfucker. Here, I should fucking kill that motherfucker. And now he's screaming. Okay. There's no, there's no mistake of what he said. That is what he said. And while revealing all of these new details, Michael says them with confidence and with conviction. He says, yes, this did happen. And these kids did tell me these things. But mind you, this is 14 months after the incident. And so the court actually pulls up Michael's interrogation footage and his story that he told. And you would think 22 hours after an incident versus 14 months after an incident, you're probably going to remember all of the details a lot better 22 hours after the incident rather than 14 months and so they pull up Michael's interrogation footage and they say well you're saying all these details now but 22 hours after the incident you did not mention these very vital details the guy that was in the back is getting really agitated and I my windows up I can't hear everything he's saying but you know there's a lot of fuck him and fuck that and um, fuck that bitch. And I don't know if they're singing or what, but it's like, um, they're saying, kill him. Michael furthermore even says that as Jordan was getting out of the car, Jordan was saying things like, I'm going to kill you. And even said, quote, this shit's going down now. What's going through your mind when he said this shit's going down now? This was a clear and present danger. And I said, um, you're not going to kill me, you son of a bitch. Okay, and as you said that, were you looking at him or were you now moving that, to get that part? Uh, I said that as I was retrieving my pistol. Could you show the jury exactly what you did? Well, if, um, if we say over here is my glove box, um, I'm looking out the window and I said, you're not going to kill me, you son of a bitch, and I shot. Okay, and do you even recall how many times you shot? I do not, kind of was um, in a fixed position with the tunnel vision. I didn't realize the SUV was moving. I was still aiming at the rear passenger and it didn't register that the car was backing up. If Jordan's intention, hypothetically, was to kill Michael, it would make absolutely no sense for him to get out of the car in the first place. What is he going to do? Open up his door three feet, squeeze himself in between two cars, shoot, and then squeeze himself back into the car? But when the three boys took the stand, Laylin, Tevin, and Tommy, all three of them said that yes, Jordan was mouthing off, but there was no threats of violence. Jordan wasn't a physically violent guy like that. So there would be no reason for him to even say something like that. Like that doesn't even sound like something that would come out of Jordan's mouth. Specifically, Leyland had said that Jordan said, quote, go F that guy. Turn up the music. I'm not listening to a stranger on how loud I want my music. And then at that point, that's when Michael turned to them and said, quote, are you talking to me? And Jordan said, quote, yeah, I'm talking about you. And then Michael, without hesitation, 
goes in his glove box, grabs his gun, and starts to open fire. And even Witness 7 said that he saw and heard Michael say, quote, nope, you're not going to talk to me that way before him seeing himself, Michael, take a gun and point it at the car as the car is trying to whip it out of the parking lot. At this time, that's when the court starts asking him, well, where was Rhonda during this situation? Was Rhonda with you? And at the mention of Rhonda, Michael starts to tear up. He starts to get extremely emotional. There's a portion where he can't even speak because he's so choked up about his love for Rhonda. But when it comes to the actual murder of an innocent 17-year-old boy, his tears are nowhere to be found. His sympathy and empathy is nowhere to be found. So at this trial, Rhonda is actually called up to the stand. And honestly, I give Rhonda so much credit for doing what she did because you can clearly tell how sweet and angelic and kind Rhonda is. Rhonda is actually a nurse. I forgot to mention that earlier. So it makes sense why she has this very warm and loving nature about her, but she does not fabricate anything. She doesn't make up lies in order to make Michael look better or to like help him out in any way. The court is asking her questions like, when you got in the car after the shooting, did Michael mention at all that he saw another weapon in the car? And Rhonda just straight up says no. He never mentioned that there was a weapon in the car, not even when we got to the hotel, not even on the ride home. He never said that he saw a weapon. Love her a lot. Right? Yes, sir, I do. Right. And when she got into that car, she asked you what happened, right? Yes, sir. Sir, are you telling this jury that on the way back to the hotel, you told Rhonda Rauer that the boys in the car had a gun? If I told her on the way to the hotel, I told her um, several times at the hotel, I told her several times on the way home that this was self-defense. That wasn't my question. From the time you left the gate station to the time you got back to the Sheraton, how many times did you use the word gun to describe what the boys, let me finish, what the boys in the car had? I couldn't tell you. Was it more than one? At least one. Mr. Dunn, the truth is you never told the love of your life that those boys had a gun. You weren't there. Did you? You did tell her then? I said you were not there. I, I get that. I know that. Truth is, you never told Rhonda Rauer they had a gun. That is incorrect. Remember to speak uh, loudly into the microphone so everybody can hear you, all right? Yes, sir. All right, uh, Ms. Wolfson. When you came out of the gate gas station and you got into the defendant's car? Yes. Did the defendant ever tell you he saw a gun in that red SUV? No. Did the defendant ever tell you that he saw a weapon of any kind in that SUV? No. There was no mention of a stick? No. There was no mention of a shotgun? No. There was no mention of a barrel? No. There was no mention of a lead pipe? No. Back in the hotel room, Ms. Rauer, that same night, did the defendant ever tell you that he saw the boys with a firearm? No. Did he ever tell you that he saw the boys with a weapon? No. On the two-hour drive the following morning, did the defendant ever tell you that he saw a gun in the SUV? No. And on that two-hour drive, did he ever tell you he saw a weapon of any kind no. in that SUV? No. So Rhonda just flat out tells the court everything that she knows and tells the truth. And then on February 15th of 2014, that is when Michael was found guilty for the murder of Jordan Davis and three counts of attempted murder towards 18-year-olds Tommy Storms, Tevin Thompson, and Leyland Brunson. Michael was given a 90-year sentence, but seven months later on October 1st, seven months into his sentence, he was actually given another life sentence without possibility of parole and so as of today in 2023 he's still living out his life sentence at the max security oregon state penitentiary and he is in there for the rest of his life no possibility of parole no possibility of release as far as the aftermath of all of this unfortunately the aftermath he is still just so infuriating because uh, michael had actually sent some letters 
letters to Rhonda while he was in prison, but I'm assuming that Michael didn't know that these letters were going to be public information because within these letters, Michael is just blatantly racist, like extremely racist. And a quote that he said in one of his letters reads, quote, the fear is that we may get a predominantly black jury and therefore unlikely to get a favorable verdict. Sad, but that's where this country is still at. And by favorable verdict, I think he just means let go without penalty, but your actions have consequences. Murder has consequences. Another one of Michael's letters reads, quote, this jail is full of blacks and they all act like thugs. This may sound a bit radical, but if more people would arm themselves and kill these N-word idiots, they may get the hint. And another quote, and in my opinion, one of the most infuriating quotes reads, quote, the only person at fault here isn't with us anymore. It was 100% on Jordan, 100%. I don't even take half a percent. He made that happen. Everything about that was on him. Michael still believes that he was in the right. He believes that he acted justfully. He believes that this whole situation is still on Jordan and refuses to take any responsibility for what he did that day. Jordan didn't ask Michael to shoot at him. Jordan didn't and ask Michael to shoot the back of the truck even though they were trying their hardest to get out of there so that their friend could get the help that they needed. Jordan didn't ask Michael to shoot at them. Jordan didn't ask Michael to get out of his car and continue shooting at the back of their car. Jordan didn't even ask Michael to make a comment about the volume of the music. Even afterwards, when Jordan had passed away, Jordan didn't ask Michael to lie on the stand, thus getting him more time in jail. Jordan didn't tell Michael to lie in the interrogation room, making him look even worse than what he did. Jordan didn't tell Michael to go back to the hotel and not a police station. It's just so crazy that Michael still believes, even today, as of 2023, this happened in 2012. Over 10 years later, this man still thinks that he did the right thing by killing an innocent boy. I just, I can't get over that. But nonetheless, that is the end of today's story. Michael, to this day, is still living out his life sentence and will never be released. But if you guys found this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're on YouTube or if you're on Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts. Make sure to rate it five stars because that really helps me out a lot. If you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. That's all from me. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to be safe out there, but go outside today. Enjoy the nice weather if it's nice by you. And even if it's cold and rainy, enjoy the little rainy weather. Sometimes rain is a little bit nice. But as always, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I will see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs>